Oh, you ought to see the new house for the children. Ooh, glory. Oh, your house is looking good, but I, I'll tell you what. I was, I was in there a day before yesterday. I didn't go there yesterday. Um, I had other pressing appointment with the Spirit to finish this message. But uh, when I was there um, on, on Friday... And before I left, it was exciting to walk through the rooms and see all the work that the ladies have done and, and the guys that helped too. Um, it's, it's just, it's fabulous. I'm, I'm excited. It reminds me of the place in the past where we came from before we came here. Uh, you see the, the same life and joy of being not only a Christian, but being a cowboy Christian, having that, that country effect and that place to come, it's, it's great. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. Anyway, I have a new message for you this morning. And um, we're going to travel back in time. I know Eric was talking about the future, and I've been talking about the future and everything. But I think the past that we're going to will include and, and empower us and encourage us of this new transformation that we're going to take that's going to take place in the next week so uh, if you come here next Sunday you'll probably be alone and wonder why the parking lot is empty um, it's 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 no longer a church because the body of Christ that envelops that church or builds that church or establish that church because of the presence of God in us. The church is leaving. This will then be a empty building. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> I've been uh, praying quite extensively uh, through the night about this message because of the the fact that um, I'm asking for the Spirit's direction and help to um, be the only speaker here because I can get so excited and get to traveling in different directions and I want to stay focused on what word he's given me this morning. This is a passage that all of us have probably read. You probably have all kinds of highlights and notes in here. This is this is the story of Moses. <coughs> So I want to begin in chapter 3 here, which is not the beginning of his life. This is, this is like 40 years after his, his birth. But I want to read uh, 14 verses, so I'm going to go right straight through them. But when it comes to my message, we're only going to focus on the first five. So let's begin. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Mid Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he, God said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off of your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moreover, God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. Listen I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, and the Hit Hivites and the Jerubs Jebusites. So those are all tongue, they're all ites. You got that right? They're all ites. 
Now, therefore, before, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Whew. There's some powerful stuff taking place in this short version. I encourage you to go on and read the, the rest of the chapter, but I'm going to focus mainly on these first five verses because I really, I, I, that's why I'm saying I, I could really get involved in this because of the understanding. I said, listen to this. And, and it was talking about God heard his, his people, Israel. He heard their voices. He heard their cries. He's seen their oppression. And it's so easy for me to get involved in that and turn around and say, it's the same thing today. Do you see it today? And the answer is yes. Are we oppressed? Are we depressed? Are we, are we being bound by the rulers of the, not Egypt, but the rulers of our nation? The answer is yes. The rulers of our government, of our, of our state of Idaho. Are we in being oppressed? The answer is yes. Open your eyes. But that's not the story I'm looking for. And I don't believe that's the story that God is revealing here. What I'm, I'm saying to you is, listen to this. This is the title of my message today. Without God's fire, it's only a bush. Did you hear that? Without God's fire, it's only a bush. And as we see in these, in these chapters here, uh, the story of, Mo of Moses, Moses was a, a shepherd at this time in his life. Remember, he was, he was born and then the king was put a decree to kill all the um, Israel boys, the males, and so on and so forth. And Pharaoh's daughter took Moses in and raised him up, okay? And so then he turned around and killed the servant or the, the soldier of, of the Egyptian king, and they cast him out, right? He ran for his life is basically what happened. So in this three, this chapter three here is going to share with us that it was just a regular, I need, I need you to understand this. It was just a regular old thorn bush. But then something changed, something happened that caused Moses to look upon this bush. It was no different than probably a hundred other bushes over the last 40 years that he's been seeing out there in the desert, tending to the sheep and the goats. He's seen all kinds of rocks and trees and, and bushes and thorn bushes and good berry bushes and all kinds of stuff out there as he wandered around. But there was something about this bush. Look at verse one. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Median. And he led the flock to the back part of the desert and came to Horeb, Horeb the mountain of God. The one thing that scripture does not, uh, does not reveal to us here is something that we need to look back. We're not going back, but I'm going to tell you is that the Egyptians considered a shepherd an abomination. Now, remember, Moses was raised by who? The Egyptians. He was under their learning. In fact, back in chapter two, it talks about that he went to school with the Egyptians and he was learned in, learned in the best of the teachings. And yet here he is, what they call an abomination. And this man who's now out there, uh, and at one time he looked at this as being prejudice and he became the very thing he was taught to hate. Verse two, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. It wasn't the berries of the bush that 
that uh, drew Moses' attention. It was the fire and the fire that in, engulfed the bush. There were some things that about, there was something about this fire, the fire that drew Moses. It did not consume the fire, but I want you to see that the Lord used two very common things. First, a bush, second, a fire. And combined with this uncommon way, the bush was not consumed because of the presence of God. It was there, the bush was the fire flame, the bush was being used so that God could talk to Moses. The flame, the bush, drew his attention and then the bush spoke to him. With God's fire, the bush became God's dwelling place. With God's fire, the bush became God's dwelling place. Look at verse three. Then Moses said, I will now turn away, or excuse me, aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn? What's with this fire? It's God's presence. It wasn't a regular fire, because if it had been a regular fire, it would have consumed that bush, and Moses would have been looking at nothing but a bunch of ashes, and the flames would have gone out. But there was something about this bush that drew his attention because the fire that came upon this bush did not consume the bush. But then it soon became the presence of God and he began to speak to Moses. Had it just been a regular bush, it would have just burned up. But the important thing is there would have been no voice. In Hebrews eleven twenty seven, Paul shared this with us where it says, by faith he forsook, talking about Moses, or departed Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. He wasn't concerned about the king. He wasn't fear of the king. For he endured as seeing him, God, who is visible, invisible. Endured means to be strong and steadfast. Moses was seeking God the whole time, believing that he would still fulfill God's purpose. That's what endurance is. Notice that endurance is tied to our ability, our ability, our ability to see God. No, I'm not talking about the physical eyes. I'm talking about the spiritual eyes. The ones that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, where it says, for we walk by what? We walk by faith, not by sight. See, if God said it, I believe it. That's all that matters. That I believe that I have faith in the word of God. It is truth. It is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me him. Amen. Amen. Hold your places there for just a second. And I want to go to Acts chapter 7 for just a moment. Continuing on with the story of Moses here in verse 20. If you're there, say amen. If you're going to listen to me, say amen. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Acts chapter 7, verse 20 through 25. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. Did you hear that? God knows you. He created you. He knows you. It says here that he was born and was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. Then, because of his age, they could no longer hide him. I'm kind of giving you an in-betweener there. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned. Remember what I was talking about a minute. He was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, he came into the house. It came into his heart, excuse me, came into his heart to visit his brethren. Remember, he's still an Israelite. He's still a Hebrew. But he was raised and learned in the Egyptian manner, in Egyptian uh, uh, type of life. He, he was born or he was raised up in a, in a king's uh, mansion. Um, and now when he was 40, it came to his heart to visit his brethren, which was the Hebrews, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed, now listen to this, he supposed that his brethren, the Hebrew, would have understood that God would deliver them from his hand or by his hand. 
but they did not understand. He had spent 40 years in the wilderness not running from God or trying to put himself or put God out of his mind, but seeking God and asking for another chance to be the deliverer God called him to be. Don't give up. God will not give up on us. He will not give up on you. He already has a plan, as we know in Jeremiah 29. He has a plan for your life, for my life. And that plan, yes, we have choices. We make choices that divert. But he is a God of love and a a God of of favor on us that he's going to do everything he can to bring us back to the right path because he has a plan. He has a purpose. And the same thing is happening here with Moses. Moses was looking for God. Therefore, his interest in this burning bush that was not consumed. Could this be the appointment with God he had been so patiently seeking? The fire of the bush? The fire was God himself. Back to Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4. So when the the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, said, Moses, Moses. He said, here am I. Now imagine, I kind of talked about this this morning, you know, in my little things that I do when I get overly excited. Like, what would happen if all those people that stayed home today was called to worship? Well, just imagine this. Imagine if Moses had been so busy in tending to his flock. Because remember, it was his father-in-law's flock. And so it was very important that he didn't lose any of them or that he didn't just go around sitting and start reading a book. But he had to tend to that flock. He had to make sure they were protected, so on and so forth. So imagine if he was so busy taking care of the sheep He was too busy to even inquire about this burning bush. And not only the burning bush, but he never would have heard God's voice. Sometimes we get so busy, we don't hear God's voice. Remember when Jesus came walking on the water to his disciples? Well, actually, he was going past his disciples. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 48, it says, Jesus would, listen, Jesus would have passed them by. Something's going on in my ears. Jesus would have passed him by, but they cried out. Then he responded to them. You got to remember, see, Jesus, Jesus was in the same storm as they were. He was walking through the storm. They were in the boat, okay? He, is, um, he wasn't in a house or out of the elements. He was very aware of their situation, and he's very aware of our situation. But when we're doing the Lord's bidding, he is responsible for us. Wow. Hmm. Ponder on that for a minute. And we can rest assured he knows our situation completely. He knows and understands every situation that we're going in and out and through. He may be... uh, One thing that I will tell you that he won't always be early. But one thing I know for sure... He's never late. Amen. The Lord will take himself, make himself available to us, but we have to first place a demand on his ability. So what is that demand? What is the definition of demand? That means that I'm telling God what to do. No, that's not what demand means. It says to ask or call for with authority. If you remember in the word, it says that he's given us all authority. He's given us all wisdom and understanding. He's equipped us with everything we need to do the work of Christ. So when we call, we call with the authority of what he's already done. It's not even relying on me, other than the fact that I believe and trust in him. You may be thinking, how can I demand anything of the Lord? By operating in and by faith. If Jesus has already done it, it's mine. If he's already provided it, it's mine. Salvation is mine. How do I know that? Because Jesus loves me. He died for me. My sicknesses are, have already been dealt with. How do I know? The word says he bore all my sicknesses and diseases. God has come down to earth in the form of a fire. 
and was inhabiting this bush just to talk to Moses. Think about that for a minute. Just to talk to Moses. God was using a thorn bush as a dwelling place. Look at verse 5. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off of your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Encounters like this with the Lord don't come to those who are not seriously seeking the Lord. Again, I'm going to quote Jeremiah chapter 29 and 13 this time. And it says, And you will seek me, and you will find me, when you search for me with all of your heart. See, God is, is not just a God that's going to respond to a voice. God is going to respond to those who are seeking him, those who are trusting him, those who want more of him. They, you, I want to consume him as he is consuming me. The only thing that made that ground holy was the presence of God. This thing that makes us holy is God's manifested presence in our lives. Therefore, there was a temple, or let me say it this way. Before there was a temple or a tabernacle, there was a bush. Hmm. The Lord, the Lord, Lord God is not limited by the size or the shape or the uh, substance of a place. He only desire is to dwell. Think about this. Where is God dwelling today? Oh, he's the big guy sitting up there in heaven someplace on his throne. No, my Bible says he dwells in me. He lives in me, that I am the temple of the living God. Let me, tell, let me ask you today, is the fire burning? Do people see the fire in us? I'm not just talking about excitement here. I know you all know I can get excited. But it's not the excitement, it's the fire. It's the presence of God being just uplifted in me to want to share so much of what he's doing in my life and what he can do in and through your lives, through all of our lives. That's the consuming fire. He wants to consume us. But like the fire, like the bush that, that uh, Moses seen there in the desert, it didn't consume the fire or the bush. But you could see his presence. God's presence, God's essence, and his fire can dwell anywhere and everywhere he desires. Amen, Amen is right. The Lord's passion is to do more than simply dwell in bushes or tabernacles or temples or churches. Huh? God did not send his son to die on a cross for nature or for man-made structures. Those were never to be his primary dwelling place. God desires much more than those types of dwellings. Ephesians, you don't have to go there. I'm going to read it to you. Ephesians chapter 2, write it down in your notes, beginning in, chat, in verse 19. And I'm going to read, read through 22. This is what Paul says. We are no longer going along with what Eric was saying this morning. I am a new creation. I'm no longer the old man I used to be. I am a new man in Christ. Verse 19 says, we are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Look at verse 21, highlight this, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom, verse 22, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. You are God's dwelling place. God has come, listen, listen, as he did with Moses, he came to consume that bush. The presence of God, that fire that day came for one purpose, to speak to Moses. God is dwelling in us today. I pray the fire is burning bright. 
So not only that God can speak to us, but God can speak through us. Come on. I'm trying, Lord. I know you're all sitting there looking at that Bible, just sucking it up and just, oh man, God is so good. God's desire is to dwell in the hearts and the minds of the redeemed. That's you and I. We call ourselves redeemed. We call ourselves Christians. But do people see the fire? Yeah, I know they see a different person that long, no longer may cuss or may no longer drink as much as they used to drink because there's no, nothing wrong with drinking. The Bible says don't get drunk. But we're no longer doing some of the things that we used to do. Why? Because there's been a change that's taken place. But did we quench the fire or are we feeding the fire? Listen to part of the prayer of Jesus in John 17 that the, um, the Gospel of John shares with us. I'm going to start in verse 21. It says, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you have sent me. That the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. I have given to them. That they may be one, even as we are one. Here's the consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. His son, Jesus Christ, he's sent to the world to redeem us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness so that we could enter into the fire, that we could enter in the presence of Almighty God, that God could take residence in us. Why? So others could see Christ in us. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world, listen, and that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you loved me. This is not, no, there is no doubt that our Lord seeks to dwell in us. How does he do this? All we have to do is allow his Holy Spirit. See, it's that simple. Remember last week I was talking about, oh, I think it was Wednesday night we were talking about the simplicity of the word, where Paul says, I fear the simplicity of the world. word. Why? Because it's so simple. People don't get it. How can, how can something so great be free? I have to work for everything. Everything I get, I have to work. I have to earn. I have to do all this stuff in order to get. Yeah, that's the way it used to be. But then came a man named Jesus. <laughs> And he completed all the work. He fulfilled the law so you and I don't have to operate under the law. We operate under his grace because he is grace. All we have to do is be born again and experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Every one of us this morning can be that bur burning bush. We've read, we've read about here this morning in, in Exodus. You and I can be the dwelling place of God's holy presence. We should be, not we, we will be and we can be, but I believe it's be that we should be already. If we've accepted Jesus Christ, if we are a believer in what Jesus did for us, the presence of the Holy Spirit has already taken up residence in here. <sighs> you and I can be the dwelling place of God's holy presence and fire. Notice I added a little separation there. We love his presence we're just not sure about the fire. Well, what will the fire make me do? Nothing you don't want to do. But whatever you seek after from God, the fire starts rising up and starts becoming warmer and warmer. And then it becomes hotter and hotter. And the things that we see with our spiritual eyes and the things we hear with our spiritual ears, when, we, when that fire starts to consume, then we start hearing the voice of God. See, that's what happened to Moses. It wasn't till God consumed the bush and he consumed it so he could speak to Moses. He got his attention. This world needs our attention. They need to see us, this burning bush, and see the, the, the vitality and the, and the power that is living in that bush, in that fire. A fire that does not come from us but a fire that burns in us. 
a fire that burns through us, a fire that does not consume us, rather a fire that transforms us. I love that part. A fire that transforms us. I'm no longer, Eric was said this morning, I'm no longer the way I used to be. That old man is dead. Oh, he keeps trying to rise up. But see, you just got to get, get to that place to where you turn around and you recognize that old man is trying to speak again and he has no power, no authority over you. A fire that does not consume us, rather a fire that transform us. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. This is the God we serve. This is the God that came to save us. He doesn't want just a bunch of good people walking around this earth going someday, someday. He wants to see fire being worked, fire being consuming other lives and showing other lives. This is the life. This is God. This is where God lives, where God dwells. This is how God speaks. This is how God does things. This is how people get healed. This is how people, the things of God, the word of God, continues to be performed and people see it and they're drawn to it like they did that bush. Mm. It's also a fire that allows us to be one for the Lord and to be a vessel of the Holy Ghost. Without God's fire, we're just a bush. Some people might be offended by that, but I'm just looking at the word and it says he consumed this bush so he could speak to Moses. I believe he wants to consume us, the body of Christ, so that people can hear him, so he can talk to those who don't know him or don't know about him. Without God's fire, we're just a bush. We're just a building. We're just a church. And well, there ain't nothing going there. And you've heard me say before, why do I need your God? You're still as sick and busted and disgusted as I am. Because I hear you Monday through Friday. Do you know why God seeks us to pray, to praise, and to worship? Do you know the ultimate purpose of redemption and being renewed in the image of God? Did you hear that? In the image of God. It's simply this. God desires to share space with you. He desires to speak to you and to me and to speak through us. The only problem God has has in speaking to us is that sometimes we are not dialed in to hear God. Or I guess I could say it this way, we have too much world wax in our ears that we can't hear him. I didn't say wha just wax. I was gonna put that too much wax in our ears because we all know what that can do, how it can, you know, affect our hearing, but the Spirit said, put word, world wax, because I think that's the biggest thing that, uh, that uh, hinders us is the things of this world. This is why Jesus was referring in Matthew, look, at, oh, you don't have to look, I'll read it to you. I'm running out of time. Yep, I am. Okay, Matthew 13, 15, write that down. For the hearts of this pe people, the hearts of this people, remember who's saying this? This is Jesus speaking. The hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. So that I should heal them. Mm. That's some powerful word, words. And that was Jesus speaking to his people. To his people, the ones he came to save. The same people, you and I, that read his word, study his word. He's saying, are your ears clear? Are you focused on my word? Are you becoming a consuming fire because of my presence in your life? After being with God, Moses is no longer the same man. Neither should we be the same man. As Eric said this morning, that we've read this morning, and I've said it three times now, I'm a new creation. I'm a new man. The old man's dead. Is he? Moses is no longer the same man that he was prior to his encounter with God. He's full of God's fire, full of God's Holy Spirit. He is now a vessel of God that will stand up to Pharaoh 
and all the might of Israel, or excuse me, Egypt. He's a man who will oversee miracle after miracle and will be instrumental in freeing the whole nation of Israel. One man consumed by a fire, by a, an encounter with Almighty God who spoke to him and told him and what he was going to do and how he was going to do it and that God would be with him all the way through it. And you will see things that you've never seen before. You will do things that you've never done before. But continue to hear from me. Continue to listen for my voice. And I will lead you through. For generations they had been slaves. But it would be through Moses that God would free his people. Moses would become the leader, provider, and intercessor for those people. For 40 years until his death at 120 years old. Like the bush, Moses needs God's fire. In his own strength, Moses could do nothing, and neither can you and I. It's only with the power of Almighty God, the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, the power of his word, his spoken word. That's why he calls it his spoken word, so that you and I can turn around and speak it just as he did. He allowed God's fire to purify him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. Moses became a transformed man. Did we not hear that also this morning? I've been transformed. I am a new creation. Acts 2 shares another man. You know, it's not just Moses. There was another man that God transformed. His name was Peter. 51 days prior to Pentecost, the apostle Peter was cursing the name of Jesus. He was lying about his relationship with Jesus. He wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He was only worried about saving his own neck. Hmm? Does that sometime happen to us when we get into a crowd? But the time, by the time he came to Acts chapter 2, Peter had spent some time on sacred ground. He spent some time with a burning bush. Kneeling before a bush, Peter knelt with 119 other people on the floor of the upper room. Peter used those 10 days between the Ascension and Pentecost to ask God to purify him and fill him with the baptism of the fire of the Holy Ghost. And then on Pentecost, listen, listen, and then on Pentecost Sunday when the fire fell, the Apostle Peter was a changed agent for the Lord. See, again, if you remember back in John, before Jesus ascended, he breathed into them the Holy Spirit. So he wasn't without the Holy Spirit because Jesus breathed on all his apostles the Holy Spirit. And then he told them, go to Jerusalem and stay there until you've been endued with power. Then came upon them the fire from above. Remember there was fires above their heads. And there was a rushing wind, sound of a rushing wind. The Holy Spirit came upon them in power, in fire. Then on Pentecost Sunday, when the fire fell, he was a, saint, a changed agent. And not only that, this denying Jesus or denying Peter went out and started proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and three thousand people came and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and your Savior. Did you hear that? How did this happen? It was the fire. It wasn't Peter. Peter couldn't do it. Remember, Peter tried walking on the water. And he did it for a few feet. But then he started looking at the storms and all the things of life and everything that's coming at us. And next thing you know, we start sinking, sinking, sinking. But one thing we may never forget, we should never forget, there stood Jesus and he reached down and he pulled him back to safety. He's always there. But he is. He wants us to be that consuming fire. When we receive God's fire, we are never the same. We should never be the same because it's him dwelling in us. It's him dwelling through us. It's him dwelling to us. God's fire changes us. God's fire cleanses us. God's fire ignites our heart for God and for others. We've, God's fire will enable us to praise and worship. 
and praise and rejoice. God's fire makes a, a prayer warrior out of us. It's the, it's the presence of God. It's not how many great words I know and how many I can think of. It's the power of God, the fire of God that is dwelling in us, that rises up. And out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. And our mouth, according to the word, should be speaking mysteries. Why? Because of the fire that dwells in us. See, if we only want to just be saved, that's good. That's great. But if you want to do more, if you want to be more of what God has planned in your life and God has prepared you to do and prepared us as a church to do in this new venture that we're going through, we need more. We need the fire of God. Let me tell you, in today's world, you can't just reach anybody just by telling, oh, by the way, do you know Jesus? Let me tell you a story about this man. I believe we're walking into, I was even said to my wife yesterday, have you ever noticed that there's more evil movies coming out about devils and, and devil worship? And every, they're on TV on, on the, on the uh, advertisements right there in your face. And we become so accustomed to them that when the time comes when this evil one shows up, nobody knows him. They can't recognize him. Why? Because he looks like everything else we paid $20 a piece, to, a, a piece for to go watch in the movies or to watch on TV. He's revealing himself and we're going, oh, wow. Let me pay more money for that. Let me spend more time watching this. Without God's fire, it was just a bush. It is also true that without God's fire, church is just a building. I shared that earlier. Without God's fire, uh oh, watch, a congregation can be at best, a heatless fellowship. A heatless fellowship. You know what? I hear people come in this place. I'm so, I'm so excited when people, new people come in and I get to hear them talk about how loving and great and how, how awesome the people of this church are. And it is so true. It is true. There's so much love in here. There's so much goodness in here. There's so much fellowship in here. Amen. And I've heard a few of them say they feel the presence of God here. I'd like to hear them all say, when I walked in here, I felt the presence of God. I felt the heat. This place is not heatless. This place is filled with heat because the fire of God resides here. Amen. You and I can be a witness for God just as much as that burning bush that drew uh, Moses to it. However, it's up to us to make sure that God's fire is working in our hearts and in our lives. This is our part. God's already done his part. It's up to each one of us, whether we are a church on fire, a family on fire, or individuals on fire. In the book of Revelation, I don't know if Frank's got, no, I know Frank's got past this one because it's in chapter 3. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a couple of years ago, I think you were in chapter 3. So here's a reminder. I'm not going to spill any beans. This is a reminder. Chapter 3, verse 7. Listen to this. One church stood out. For it's faithfulness and fire. You got to go read this verse. So write it down. You got to go read it. One church stood out for its faithfulness and its fire. It was the church of Philadelphia. It was called in verse 8, the church of the open door. Philadelphia was a church on fire and God was opening all kinds of doors for them. Did you hear that? It was a church on fire. Fire is what? The presence of God. Not just God is here. God is working here. God is speaking here. See, that's what happened to Moses with the burning bush. God spoke to Moses. Philadelphia was a church on fire and God was opening all kinds of doors for them. And in response, they were opening up the doors of their hearts for God and for the, and for the least and the lost. 
Everyone, be, everyone who came to their church was overwhelmed with God's love and mercy. They were enjoying and living the fires of the Lord. Ooh, I love that part. They were living the fire of the Lord. Amen. Philadelphia was a burning bush for the Lord. He resided there. But then we come to verse 14, where there was another church, one that I'm going to call a pilot church or a pilot light. Every one of you here with gas stoves know what a pilot is, right? It's that little tiny flickering flame that's always on, but only when you turn up the gas. This church I'm calling a pilot light church. Verse 14 says the best it could do was to provide a lukewarm atmosphere. That's why a pilot church, a pilot light. The people possessed a haughty spirit. And if you read, that's what it says, a haughty spirit. Many of those that attended this church looked down on others. They spent their time judging and being critical about those who attended their services. I've been in those churches. I've been in those churches. We don't worship God that way. <laughs> we don't dress that way. Verse 17, this church was under the misconception that it was wealthy and needed nothing. Read that. It's in the verses. It, th it thought it was the best congregation around. But in God's eyes, it was poor, wretched, pitiful, blind, naked, and sick. A sick, a sick congregation. It needed a burning bush experience. That's all it would have took. But see, they thought they, were, they had it all. They th thought they knew it all. So they didn't need to have that burning bush experience. They didn't need to have the Holy Ghost coming in there and baptize them in the Holy Ghost and start allowing the, the word of God and the presence of God to work in and through them. It needed to become God's mouthpiece. It needed to repent and be transformed in God's presence. They needed the fire of God. Without God's fire, a church is just a building. Just like the bush was just a bush. People who hunger after the fire, though, watch, becomes God's mouthpiece. See, this is, this is why I'm sharing this today, because of our move. I'm telling you, I've been around, I've been through those streets over there. I don't live there, but I drove through the streets. And I see all those cars and I see all those people. And why aren't they, why aren't they in a church? Why aren't, how, man, the doors of opportunity. And I'm saying, I'm crying out to God, put the fire in us. Let them see the consuming God you are living in us operating, working in us. When we move in here, when we come, we're taking possession of Caldwell. Praise God, there's other churches there. But they better grab the fire. Because I want a church of fire. I want people of fire. People that want to go out and share the good news and just teach and love on people like you love on everybody that walks in here. Those people need to know that kind of love that you have when you, people walk in here for the first time. People who hunger after, after the fire belong to uh, become God's mouthpiece, speaking his message of salvation, sanctification, and holiness. See, it all goes together. It's not just about, just come on in, and we're going to teach you about Jesus and get you baptized and turn you out. No. We want to show you how God's going to sanctify you and prepare you for an opportunity to share what he's given you to other people with excitement, with joy, and with hope, and with fire. To use them as sacred places where people can experience the true freedom, not a partial freedom. My God is not a partial God. Be purified from all their sins and experience a transformed baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's a transforming spirit. And whatever is still holding on you, if you allow him, he'll consume it. 
and show you you no longer need it. He is all you need. Sorry, I didn't mean to yell. I was trying my best not to yell this morning. Today, this is, I'm closing now. So I'm going to settle down. Watch. But I will say this. Today, of all times, as we see these times coming, we all know. Every believer that has ever read this book and has a relationship with Jesus Christ knows that time is short. If they don't, they don't know Jesus. They have no relationship with him. They have no spirit living in them. The body of Christ needs the fire of God moving, not just, not just taking possession, but he, he needs to move. You remember back in, in, in Genesis 1 where it says that God looked and the, and the earth was without form and darkness and the spirit was hovering over the, over the waters. Remember I told you, that was the spirit of God. He's waiting for one thing and one thing only. For God to speak. He's living in you and he's waiting for one thing and one thing only. And that's for you to speak the word of God to somebody. And then watch him move. Get excited. Because when he does, you're going, you're going to see somebody's life changed. They're not going to hell. Satan just lost the battle because of one word, one consumption of fire that went out and changed a man or woman or child's life. The presence of God, the presence of God, listen to me. The presence of God is fire. See, this is what happened that night in Pentecost. Fire came down. And when the fire came down, Moses led and released the people out of bondage of the king. Listen to me. This is, if we change Moses to your name, you change it to your name. To change people, to take people out of bondage. See, Satan has this world in bondage. And the leaders that are, are, who are following this, this satanic and this socialistic and, and communistic world way are leading people into bondage. That's what it's all about, to be a government rule. And you have no voice, no feet, no nothing. It's not yours, it's theirs. And that's the work of Satan. He works in the same manner. He's there to steal, kill, and destroy the word of God that's in you. He hates you. And we see that the government is hating us too. Don't bring that word in here. Don't speak that name. You want your religion? Go on in your house and keep your mouth shut. Sorry. No, I'm not. We need people that are no longer in bondage and we need to release that fire that's in us and allow people also to be released from that bondage and that oppression and depression. You know why people commit suicide? Because of oppression. They're depressed. People tell them you're no good. You're worthless. That's the work of Satan. Man, we need fire. We need fire people out there working. I'm not talking about firemen to put the fire out. I'm talking about people that are going to light the fire. <laughs> anyway, he can do it again. God can do it again. Though uh, through us who seek him. Revelation 3.21, I'm going to end with this. He who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me. This is Jesus speaking. I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. How did Jesus overcame, overcome the works of Satan? By the word of God. How do you and I overcome the works of Satan? By the word of God. The same word that Jesus spoke. Every time Satan tempted him, he spoke the word of God. He didn't say, hey, dude, you know who I am? I created you. And you're going to bring that to me? No. He said, thus saith the Lord. 
Thus saith the Lord. See, this is what the word says. Bring it on. But this is what the word says. Those things that you're trying to push into our children and stuff, that's an abomination before my God. And I won't put up with it. Because I'm the fire. He who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Amen? We want to sit on that throne. We want to sit next to Jesus. And I want to hear these great words of his, well done, my good and faithful servant. But we have to learn to become a consuming fire. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to just start building that fire from a little pilot light to be a consuming fire that totally consumes us and our focus is on him. Because see, if our focus were on him, if believers' focus was on him, every church in America would be filled to overflowing. I'm telling you that for truth. It would be. But see, when the fire is not burning, there's nothing to draw them. Remember what Moses, he says, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm leaving the sheep. I'm leaving the goats. I got to go find out more about that fire. It wasn't the berries on the bush. It was the fire that drew Moses to that place standing before God and God spoke to him. If you want God to speak to you, you've got to go to the fire. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to tell you all what a privilege it is and it has been to be your pastor here at this building and sharing. And once again, I want to thank all of you who have been there to help us set up, tear down, set up, tear down, set up, tear down. But you know, praise God, we made it through every one of those times and even the special times. I mean, God has been so faithful and so great to us. I just can't wait to see what he has for us in this new building where we don't have to tear down and, and set up. We don't have to haul our equipment in trailers anymore. Amen. I mean, that's, that in itself is a great joy and a great blessing. Um, but I, I just, I think, the re I, I believe in my heart, the reason that this move is so great for us is because now instead of spending our time setting up and tearing down, we'll be able to go out and find and search and seek those who are lost. Amen.